using a distributed key value store. And the word I really want to emphasize in that title is using, because our talk today is about how you would actually use a, a distributed key value store in your application. We're Nick and Andy. We're engineers at PinCap, where we both work on TyKV, which is an example of a, a key value store, um, as we'll, we'll tell you a bit later in the talk. The talk is going to be in three parts. So first of all, we're going to talk very quickly about what a, um, a key value store actually is and um, some example KV stores and about their features and how you would choose one of them for your application. After that, well, we have to, to pick one of those to actually talk about for the rest of the, the talk, and we're going to pick TyKV. Now, that is obviously a, bi a biased choice, but um, hopefully it will be an appropriate choice for some of you, and the more general principles will apply to, to other KV stores too. Then the, the bulk of the talk is about how your application communicates with a distributed KV store, in this case, TyKV. So to start off, I'm going to hand over to Andy, who is going to talk about how to choose a KV store. So I'm Andy. Thanks for the introduction. I'm here to talk to you in this section about what is a KV store and what are the KV stores available. Further, I will talk about their pros and cons. So in the beginning, what is the KV store? You might have already been using KV stores in your programming language. For example, the dictionary in Python or the map in other programming languages are KV stores. This example in Python is a dictionary that maps the key k1 to value v1 and key k2 to value v2. KV stores often allows you to look up the value by the corresponding key. For instance, curing this dictionary with key k1 will return its value v1. This operation are often called get. Except get. The KV store also have method put and delete for modifying the data. In the real world, a KV store often refers to a database that persists gigabytes to terabytes of data in the form of key value instead of this small dictionary in Python. But once you search for KV stores in Google, and then you will be drawn by too many KV stores, which may only have subtle differences and you must struggle to figure out which one best fits your needs. So I will pick some of the most common ones and talk about their pros and cons and different kinds of scenarios they are best for. You may have heard of RocksDB. It is built by Facebook and it is a high performance embedded KV store. What embedded means is that it's a library and it doesn't provide a standalone binary and doesn't have network interface or protocols either. You will have to write a program on top of it and talk to it with function calls in C. It is high performance because it has been tuned by many talented engineers with decades of effort. They've done many optimizations on disk I.O. and interior data structure. What RocksDB is not good at is that it runs on a single machine, which makes it not scalable and not failure tolerant, because the only machine fails or fails. So RocksDB is best for prototyping or running single node application. This in particular talking about when the scale of data still fits in a single machine, which is approximately up to a few terabytes. And for prototyping, we usually don't care the failure tolerance, so RocksDB is enough. ETCD is a strongly consistent distributed KV store. It is a widely used and tested implementation of ref algorithm. So it guarantees the soundness of consistent as well as persistent. But naive ref algorithm doesn't do well on data on large scale which makes ETCD become unstable with data larger than 8 gigabytes. 
So ETCD is good for simple KV scenario that requires strong consistency and strong persistence. This scenario are usually method in storage or service discovery. Redis is a widely used memory distributed database. It features in building types, building replication, low latency, and high throughput. But it doesn't guarantee the data is consistent or persistent. So the data stored in Redis are usually allowed to be lost. Redis is usually used as cache for other underlying data stores like MySQL or MongoDB. So when the data are lost, you can always find it back from the underlying database. HBase is an open source implementation of Google Big Table. It is built on top of HDFS and has good integration with Hadoop ecosystem, especially supporting out-of-box integration with Flink and Spark. But HBase are often complained about its high latency and the stop the workforce. Besides, HBase only supports single row transactions, so you will have to use other components to achieve multi row transactions. In general, HBase is very suitable for applications built around Hadoop ecosystem. Talking to MongoDB, it is quite different to the others mentioned before. It doesn't store KV, but instead stores documents. In other words, MongoDB is a big array of JSON objects. MongoDB is distributed by sharding on given fields of documents. These simple sharding rules make it hard to dynamically balance on the right traffic. Therefore, hot write are always a problem when using MongoDB. Besides, similar to Redis, MongoDB doesn't guarantee strong consistency or persistence. So MongoDB is usually used to store semi-structured data, like user info and user history. And it also allows to lose data. In addition, because of the critical requirement on memory, it will be expensive to use MongoDB on large real products. So generally, MongoDB is best for prototyping because it's quite easy to set everything up and running. And for prototyping, the right hotspot and memory usage has not yet been a problem. All right, so uh, TyKV is another um, key value store, but it's one we're going to go into a little bit more detail about because we're going to use it as, uh, well, eff effectively like a case study for the rest of this talk. So, uh, yeah. so TyKV is distributed, uh, which means rather than running on a single server, it runs uh, across a cluster of servers or nodes. That makes it, uh, and because of that, and because of it's the way it's designed, it's scalable. If you need to store uh, more data or you need to um, access that data more quickly, you can just add, um, add nodes to the cluster and you'll be able to store more and access more. It's also fault tolerant. So if you lose um, some of those nodes, or if you've got your nodes across multiple data centers and you lose an entire data center, then uh, you should still be able to have uh, access to, to your data. TyKV is transactional. So this is a concept that is much more familiar from the kind of traditional SQL world of databases. Uh, key value stores have historically uh, um, been uh, uh, not supported transactions and had a kind of eventual consistency uh, kind of guarantee, whereas TyKV um, uh, su supports uh, um, explicit transactions and uh, gives you the kind of acid guarantees that um, that make working with um, transactional databases so much nicer. Um, and uh, it, it has a somewhat rich uh, key value API. What I mean by that is it doesn't just offer kind of the the, the dictionary hash map get set kind of API. Um, we there's a, a whole bunch of operations on um, ranges of values, uh, batches of operations, uh, various kinds of scans, and, and so forth. TyKV is uh, battle tested. So TyKV started its life as the um, the 
uh, the, the, the back end, I guess, of TidyB, which is a, um, a new SQL, if you like, database. So that's a, um, a distributed uh, transactional SQL database. And TikeV provides the, um, the, the distributed part of that, really, and, um, but without the, the SQL uh, layer, which is provided elsewhere. So TikeV by itself, or as part of TidyB, is um, used by a fairly large community of, um, of users. Some of those are huge. Um, so for example, JD Cloud, uh, Shopee, Meituan, uh, Jihu. Um, so uh, Jihu are happy for us to talk about um, some numbers. Uh, the last time um, we got some numbers from them, they had around 200. Uh, TikeAV nodes and they were um, getting about up to a hundred million reads per second from from their database on uh, on two trillion rows, which is about three hundred and twenty-ish terabytes of data. So that's that's a pretty big cluster, and the the biggest cluster that we know about is um, around sixteen hundred nodes. So when we say that TikeAV scales um, horizontally, it it can scale pretty big. Uh, TikeAV is being actively developed at the moment, uh, so we're working on um, performance in particular. So recently we uh, made some fairly major changes to our transaction protocol that uh, have resulted in big improvements to um, read and write latency. Um, we're implementing new features, for example we just added a compare and swap or CAS uh, operation. And one of the more exciting things we're working on at the moment is TikeAV's coprocessor. So the coprocessor is a component of TikeAV which lets us run uh, computation on what would otherwise just be data storage nodes. So uh, this came from TiDB, where um, for things like aggregation operations, you can get a huge performance win by uh, running uh, part of those operations on the nodes where the data is actually stored. Uh, now the, the the interface to the coprocessor is not very useful for other users, but what the, the work that is ongoing at the moment is to make the, um, the coprocessor in, uh, interfaces pluggable. And that means that whatever your, your use case, you um, hopefully will be able to run some of your computation on the TIKV nodes close to the data and get like well, hopefully huge performance benefits for you as well. And last, but by no means least, it, it's really important to note that the, the TikeAV project is entirely uh, open source and uh, governed in the open. Uh, last year we graduated as a CNCF project uh, and and um, the, the various clients that Andy's going to talk about in the next section are, are open source as well. So um, I'm going to give a little bit more, more background so you can get a, an idea of actually what the client is doing behind the scenes. And I want to talk about the, the architecture of a TikeAV cluster. So uh, here's the basic idea. You've got um, a whole bunch of TikeAV nodes and the data is sharded across uh, um, regions. So region is just a um, uh, um, uh, uh, synonym for, for shard in, the, in this case. Um, so you have the, the, the um, data is sharded into regions and then the regions are spread across um, uh, nodes using raft, which ensures kind of reliable replication of the data. And uh, it, the, the, the client is a somewhat active participant in, in interactions with, um, with the TikeAV clusters. I'll, I'll show on your next slide. Um, and the client communicates with the, the TikeAV nodes via um, uh, gRPC. We also have what we call the, the placement driver nodes, and these are responsible basically for coordination. So what that means is that uh, regions that get too big will be uh, split, and regions that get too small will be merged, and regions will be um, moved if nodes are getting too much traffic or too little traffic uh, to ensure that the, the, cl the cluster is running optimally. The other important function that the, the placement driver nodes provide is uh, timestamps. So uh, our, transactional pro our transaction protocol requires timestamps and 
the the PD cluster is is essentially a timestamp oracle. So here is that transaction protocol, and actually TACV supports various flavors of transaction protocols. This is just um, one example just to give you an idea of what's going on. Now, when I say that the client is kind of an active participant, that's because the, the transaction protocol is a collaborative protocol. So the, the client is responsible for um, its end of the protocol, and it's only if both the client and the, the TACV nodes um, all kind of do what they're meant to, that you get the, the, the consistency properties that you want from the transaction protocol. So I'll just go through this quickly. So when the, the user starts a transaction, the first thing the client does is it talks to the PD nodes to get a, a start timestamp. Then it's going to build up the transaction. So for reads, it's going to actually talk to the, the TIKV nodes. Um, and for writes, it's going to buffer those locally. And it can also cache the, um, the reads in case the, the user reads the, the same key multiple times. Then once we've built up the, the transaction, then uh, um, the, the first th thing that the, the client does is it starts the pre-write phase. And in the pre-write phase, the, the client contacts all the, the TIKV nodes that it wants to write to and make sure that the, the transaction can be, um, can be written. And at the end of this phase, it's basically got a guarantee from every node that if it commits, then that commit will succeed. And so at this point, once it's got all those um, uh, pre-write responses, then the, the client knows that the, the, the commit is guaranteed to succeed. At that point, it has to get another timestamp from PD, and then it can finally send its commit message. And it only has to send that to, to, to one node, the, the, the primary node of the transaction, and then it can return success to the user. And later on, in its own time, it's going to commit all the, um, all the other nodes in the, in the transaction. So uh, the reason I'm going into this kind of detail here is just so you can see that um, uh, the, the the interaction between kind of the client and the TIKV server is non-trivial. Okay, this is not just like the interface to to a, a dictionary like Andy showed at the start of the talk. Um, it's a bit more complicated than that because we're in this distributed um, situation. And just to really kind of make this point, this is the um, protocol buffer specification for. Um, a pre-write request, which is something the client would send to a, a TIKV node. And there's, as you can see, there's a lot of detail there. Um, and so in the, in the next section, we're going to see how uh, the, um, the, the TIKV client kind of abstracts all, all that away for you and just gives you a, um, a much nicer API so that you can concentrate in your application on the business logic and avoid all this lower level um, logic of um, transaction protocols and timestamps and um, regions and, and so on and so forth. So I'm going to hand over to, to Andy now, who's going to talk about all, all that good stuff. Thanks, Nick. Then in this section, I will talk about how to use TIKV. TIKV client is libraries in multiple languages. In this list, there are Rust, Java, Python, C++, and Go. You can use any of those that fit your need. In the following, I will show you the examples using the Python client. The clients in other languages are similar. Before that, we download the Python client with BIP using this command. TACKV client supports two different interfaces, RawKV and Transaction. They cannot be used together, so you will need to choose one of them in the beginning. RockKV is usually fast, has less overhead than transaction, therefore performs in lower latency. Still, RockKV guarantees strong consistency, but only supports single-row transaction. Transaction interface adds an extra interior. In transaction interface adds an extra interior MVCC layer on top of RockKV. Therefore, it supports multi-row atomic and snapshot isolation. This can be quite useful in OLTP scenario. So let's talk about the RockKV first. 
Rocky V client provides scan method for retrieving a value by the key. Scan method for retrieving a bunch of values by the range of key. Put method for updating and inserting. And delete for deleting. Here is a brief example for using the Rocky V. First, connect to Tiki V with the server IP. Then insert a KV pair. Then insert a KV pair by calling put method. Then we can use then we then we can use get methods with K1. Then use get method with K1. We'll return the value V1, which we inserted before. Scan method returns a list of key value pairs by the key range from K1 to the end. The scan limit is required to be explicitly stated to avoid flooding the Tiger server with an unexpectedly large result. In transaction modes, the methods in the client class is moved into the new transaction class. By calling begin optimistic or begin pessimistic on the client, a new transaction will be created. Transaction has action methods like get form update and lock keys, which is the features for pessimistic transaction. And it is a little bit out of the topic of the days, so you can find the description in the document of Ross client. Here's a brief example for using the transaction. Akin to Rocky V, connect the client to the Tiki server by specifying the IP. Then we begin the transaction. Put the KV pair of K1V1 as usual and know that other clients will not see it until commit. Here we get the value by key. Finally, commit the transaction and then all operations will become observable by other clients. Another property of transaction is that all operations between the begin and commit is guaranteed to be all success or all fail. Um, that's the, the end of the talk, so thanks for, um, for your attention. Just to, to quickly go over what we talked about, we, um, we talked about um, a, uh, how to, to choose a key value store, we covered RocksDB, uh, Redis, MongoDB, and then we dived a tiny bit deeper into, into TyKV, which is a distributed and transactional key value store. And then we talked about how your application would communicate with TyKV uh, using the, either the, the raw or the transactional uh, interfaces of TyKV via the Python client. So if you want to, to learn more, as I said earlier, um, TyKV and all its clients are um, open source projects and the, the best place to go to find out more is to go straight to the source, which is on GitHub. So you can go to any of the TyKV or the client repos and find out more about how to um, install, use, um, build, or even contribute to the, the, the different projects. If you'd rather chat with, with other humans, then the TyKV working group Slack is probably the best place to go. And if you'd rather read stuff in HTML format, then we have a website as well at tykv.org. So thanks again for sticking around to the end, and I hope you got something out of this, uh, out of the talk. So thanks very much.